you realize how incredibly fortunate you are to have your staff? Do you really? You've got Robin, even if she couldn't sing, she'd be good to look at. <laughs> and you've got Q. I knew Q before Q was. I've known his mom and dad a long, long time. And Robert Black, my, what a blessing you have to have Robert in your, in your midst. And Dr. Connor, Pope of the Plains. <laughs> you are blessed, people. You really are. Let's look at, can we have some text up here, or is it all going to be behind me? Do what? Isn't technology wonderful? Do you all know what a Super Bowl ticket cost in the end zone for today? $9,500. Do you know what a ticket on the 50-yard line cost? $16,000. And just think, you got in here free. <laughs> Let's look at this scripture. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, and various kinds of tongues. My grandmother, Effie May, died when I was 11 years old. She outlived three husbands. Her last husband and my grandmother, Effie, lived in Colorado Springs. And after Mr. Kuntz died, my uncles and my aunt and my dad thought it would be best to move my grandmother uh, to Oklahoma to be with her daughter, Frances. My Aunt Frances and Uncle Bob lived outside of McAllister, Oklahoma, in a little town called Kiowa. And so they all went to Colorado Springs and loaded up my grandmother's belongings and moved her to Kiowa, Oklahoma. My grandmother was the first person in our family to own a television set. And when she died, Praise Jesus, she left that television set to us. <laughs> now, my mother said we couldn't plug it in because televisions were of the devil. That's what she believed. But my dad led her to a point of compromise and said, Thelma, we're going to go get the television and we're going to put it in the living room. And we won't plug it in, but it was my mother's and we're going to get it. So my dad borrowed a pickup and we made it down to Kiowa, loaded up the television set, brought it home, put it in the corner of our living room. My mother put a doily on top of it and put a lamp on top of the doily. And there it sat. For weeks, it sat there. Well, finally one night, my dad said, I'm plugging this thing in. I want to see what's on. And he plugged it in. And that's the night we discovered gun smoke. <laughs> and life in the hard house was never the same after that. <laughs> Matt Dillon, Chester, Festus, Doc, and Miss Kitty. 
of the Long Branch Saloon. I think Miss Kitty was why my mom said televisions were of the devil. <laughs> my brother John and I thought Miss Kitty was pretty hot. Every Saturday afternoon, my dad would call down to the Dairy Maid, order six hamburgers, six orders of fries, and on the way he would stop by the grocery store and pick up six little bags of M&Ms. He'd bring those hamburgers and those french fries and those M&Ms home and we'd all sit down in the middle of the living room floor and eat hamburgers and french fries and M&Ms and watch Matt Dillon of Dodge City. But Matt Dillon wasn't the person who captured my attention the most. When I started watching television as an 11 year old boy, there was a slick haired, smooth talking Pentecostal evangelist from Tulsa, Oklahoma named Oral Roberts. I was mesmerized by him. Now, if you're not an Okie, you don't understand tent revivals very much, but he went all over Oklahoma setting up tents and having crusades and healing services. And in these tents, they would build these ramps and they would roll people up on wheelchairs and carry people and he would put hands on them and pray for them. And some of them would jump and run who had been crippled or had been sick. And I used to watch that. And one day I asked my dad, what's with this guy? Does he know something we don't? And my dad said, Oral Roberts claims to have the gift of healing. Of all of the gifts that we seem to tiptoe around, it's this gift, the gift of healing. And so, let's ask ourselves a question. Did Oral Roberts know something we don't know? Or perhaps better questions might be, does the gift of healing still exist? And a second question might be, are faith healers real? Now, every once in a while, I get a hankering for a greasy bowl of chili, and I go over to JJ's restaurant in Slayton and get me one. I went over Thursday for lunch. And while I was eating lunch and waiting on my chili, I picked up a thrifty nickel. You know what a thrifty nickel is? And right there on the second page, I found this ad, Healing Revival with revivalist Roy Ivins and praise singer band. February the 7th, that's next Saturday, isn't it? At 2 o'clock at the Coco Palace. You know where the Coco Palace is on 50th? Next Saturday at 2 o'clock, this guy's going to have a miracle healing service. Well, I learned a couple of things. I learned there's a faith healer in Lubbock. And the second thing I learned is you can schedule miracles. I didn't know you could do that. I thought. When God got ready for a miracle, that's when a miracle happened. I didn't know you could schedule them at 2 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. Or 
All through my ministry, people have asked me, Pastor, do you believe in divine healing, faith healing? And I've always answered them the same way. Is there any other kind? Is there any other kind of healing than that which comes from God the Father? All healing flows through God. Are faith healers for real? I've been asked that a lot of times. And I always answer like this. I believe all healing is from God. But I don't believe in faith healers. There are really three areas where we need healing. There is mental healing. You know, sometimes the mind gets sick. When I was a child, my mother was diagnosed with something. I don't even remember the name. And on two different occasions, my mother was placed in an institution and went through eight weeks of shock treatments. And I remember my dad telling my sisters and my brother and I, your mom just has some mental needs. My mom was mentally ill. And I thank the good Lord that he healed her and the last years of her life were, were very good and very enjoyable. But you know, the mind is a complex part of our being. And sometimes our minds get sick. There is a physical illness. Probably the vast majority of those of us in this room have been sick at some time or another. Our body has been ill. And I believe there is a spiritual sickness from which we need healing. In case you haven't noticed, this is a fallen world. This is a sin-sick world. And sometimes the world invades us. Sometimes it happens consciously. Sometimes it happens subconsciously. Sometimes it happens unconsciously. But the world becomes part of us and we get sick when the sickness of the world enters into our being, our spiritual nature, we get spiritually ill. And we need healing. People with mental illness need healing and people with physical illness need healing and people with spiritual illness need healing. But there is a greater question that kind of arises when you get to talking about this subject, this spiritual gift of healing. How do we balance the concept of healing in the New Testament with present day science and technology? Man, we have made unbelievable strides in medicine, haven't we? I mean, things that people used to, used to go to the hospital for cataract surgery and have to lay flat on your back for 10 days. Now, I had a friend of mine go in Thursday morning at 7, and he was at work at 8.30. It's tremendous advancements in medical technology. 
Unbelievable strides are being made every day in the treatment of the physical body. Now, in the New Testament, let me give you an example. A, a blind man came to Jesus, and Jesus spit on the ground, took a little mud, and rubbed it together, and put it in his eyes, and he could see. An instantaneous healing. And there were experiences where lame people, people who were on a mat, on a bed, and they couldn't walk, and Jesus said, Take up your bed and walk. And they took it up and they were healed and they walked away. Does that happen today? I mean, it happened with Jesus. It happened in the New Testament age. Does that still happen today? So how, how then do we balance? How do we balance what happened in the New Testament with what is happening Today, I want to suggest some things. And I want us to kind of tie into a very important verse. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church to pray over them and to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person, say it with me, well. And the Lord will what? Say it with me. Say it with me. Raise them up. It was, that sounds like what happened in the New Testament. Yes, it does. Well, now, does it happen today? That's the issue. How do we balance what Jesus did how do we balance this business of praying over people with healing today? You understand, do you not, there is, there is a desire within us for wellness. Don't, don't you want to be well? Don't you want to be well? You know, we do a lot of stuff to get well. This morning on my way to Muleshoe, I drove past a wellness center. I read the other day about chakra, crystals and gemstones that if you are hurting over here, you take this stone and put it here and it'll make the hurt go away. Or if you're hurting down here, or you take another gemstone and put it here and it'll make the pain go away. There we go. We want to be well. We use acupuncture and aromatherapy. And surgery. Chemotherapy. <laughs> and we get well. Is the healing of Jesus' day and the healing of today the same? Yes. God healed then and God heals now. God may not have a doctor who spits on the ground and rubs a little mud ball and sticks it in somebody's eye, but he may have a trained surgeon to remove a cataract. And there's healing. Now, lest you think of me in a way that would not be right, I want you to know that I believe that verse. And I want you to know I practice that verse. I pray over sick people. I have a friend right now who pastored with me alongside of me in Plainview. I was at First Baptist. He was at College Heights. He has esophageal cancer. 
He's gone through a radical regimen of chemotherapy. He is now going through a process of radiation. And if they can get this tumor shrunk enough, they're going to try to go in and surgically remove it. And I stood over his bed and I placed hands on him and I prayed for his healing. Because God is a healer. He just may use a surgeon to bring that healing. But it's not a lesser healing. He may put a chemist in the lab and that chemist may well discover some type of a treatment that can be placed upon a person with cancer and bring healing to the body. God just chose to use a chemist. But God is the healer. And I know what you're thinking. Have you ever anointed anybody with oil? Yes, I have at their request. Because I, I would hope you believe that if the Bible says that if you will pray and place hands and anoint with oil, the Lord will heal the sick. <laughs> there are really two types of healing. There is a temporal healing. That's a healing that happens to a person for instance, an individual has a disease and we pray for them and they go to the doctor, the doctor diagnoses it, they may do surgery, they may do treatment of some kind and that person gets well, okay? They're sick, they pray for healing, God heals them, they get well, but guess what happens? They still die, don't they? Don't they? You may be healed of a disease, but eventually you're going to die. So any healing that happens to us in this physical life is what? It's temporary. It's temporary. My college roommate, his first church was in a little place called Española, New Mexico. You ever been to Española? It's outside of Santa Fe. He said, I want to take you. I went out there to preach a revival one time. He said, I want to take you two places. I want to take you to a restaurant in Chimayo. And after the restaurant, I want to take you to the church in Chimayo. We went to the restaurant, and it was wonderful. We went to the church, and he said, you're not going to believe what you're about to see. We went into this little Catholic church in Santeria de Chamayo, and there was a little, a little gathering place, but he said, uh, let me take you into a, and we walked into a side room, and on all of the walls in that little room, there were crutches and, and bandages and just the walls were covered with medical type equipment. And there at the front was a little statue of the Virgin Mary. Now listen carefully. At the base of that statue, there was a hole, a literal hole in that dirt floor. And he said, there's a belief among the people of Chimayo that this Virgin Mary weeps over them and her tears dampen the soil. And when the word goes out that the Virgin has been crying, the people rush 
they dig up the dirt and they take it home and put it on their bodies for healing. At best, at best, it's temporary. But there's a second kind of healing. It's ultimate. It's eternal. I pastored at Olton for eight years. Probably the best church I ever pastored. Wonderful people. There was in the church at Olton a very godly couple. And on his 50th year, uh, this gentleman was diagnosed with liver cancer. Now, his wife was somewhat of a mystic. And she gathered a band of prayer warriors unlike I've ever seen. And they would gather two and three times a week praying for healing for this man. They tried some unbelievable things. They went to Mexico and he was took some treatments that were not even allowed in the United States. They were desperate for healing. And our church prayed that he would be healed. But his cancer got worse and he died. He died. And when they called and said that uh, Larry has passed, I went out to the house to greet his family. <laughs> and the most unusual thing happened. His wife greeted me at the door, and she was smiling. And I said to her, Doris, I am so, so sorry Larry was not healed. And she said, oh, but Pastor, he was. He was. He received the greatest healing that God has to give. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. And I saw the new Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne of God saying, This is God's dwelling place. He is now among his people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and he will be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more mourning, no more sickness, no more pain. For these things have passed away. That, my friend, is healing. Pastor. Travis, thank you for your words. We are people who know healing. We've had children in our midst the last year over the holidays. JC is with us for the first time since a difficult December and early January. Bo is in the nursery today. Evidence of God's work amongst our people and in the confidence that he's with us always. Travis, thank you. 
for challenging and blessing us today. If you're here this morning, I want to give you an invitation to come and commitment to follow Christ, an opportunity to come and join with our church fellowship. Or perhaps this morning, with this emphasis on healing, a time to come and have prayer. Prayer with Travis, prayer with myself, Quentin or Robin. Prayer this morning for God's work in your life. Let's pray together, and you come in a moment as we sing. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you work in our lives, how it may be through a medical technician or how it may be through an act unexplained, but we realize that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We give you thanks. We're grateful, Father, that we've seen you work in our midst, and we continue to hold on to the promises, Father, that you'll always work among us. Lord, in our time of invitation and commitment today, we pray that your spirit move, that we are strengthened, that we are encouraged, and that we worship you. Lord, bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and you come as the Spirit leads.